<laughs> Welcome to summer at USF. <laughs> As we were planning refreshments for this, we were considering lemonade or coffee. I think we went with the better choice. <laughs> so thank you all for being here today. It's my distinct privilege to introduce Dr. Stephen Jackson, who will be sharing with us uh, some of the uh, research he's been doing into our university's archives. Uh, I'm thrilled with the level of interest he's had in our university's history. And, and through that uh, look into our archives here, um, so many interesting things have surfaced. He's going to share some of that with you today and some of his expectations going forward as he's embarking on some very extensive uh, uh, additional research uh, in support of this initiative. So with, without any further ado, I'll turn this over to Dr. Jackson. Thank you. All right, well, thank you all for being here. Um, so the idea for this talk happened after our first of many strategic conversations that we're having this semester. And I remember very distinctly, Joy asked a question at that first meeting where she's, she asked a question about the archives and uh, you could have heard a pin drop. Uh, and I came away from that meeting thinking, maybe people don't really know what we're talking about when we're talking about these archives. Uh, and I suspect there's very few of us in this, how many people have, have like been in the archives? Poked around them a little bit? Okay, so good, good number of people in the back. A little, little bit here and there, but probably not like gone through, you probably had a specific thing you were looking for, you found it and you left as fast as you could because it's a little dusty in there. I would guess that's probably our normal situation. Uh, well, as we've been having these conversations, I kept thinking, you know, this archive is a really valuable resource. Um, and I love this quote, you'll find a lot of quotes, uh, I'm, I'm going to draw a lot from Ruben Jeske's tenure. What I'm researching right now is uh, Sioux Falls College history in the 1950s, 60s, and into the 70s. Uh, so he comes up a lot, he's great, he's very, very quotable as a president, one of the most quotable presidents I think we've had. Um, so I love this quote from him though, the past always points the way to the future. We've had, we're having all these conversations about our identity uh, as an institution, um, but for many of us, uh, we don't know the whole history of that. And I, I, I mean, it should shock anybody here to, to know that I firmly believe that history has a lot to do with our identity. Uh, and so uh, what I'm hoping to do today is accomplish a few objectives. So the first thing is just to sort of inform a little bit what do we have in these archives? What did they, what, what is in them that we might be able to use? Um, and then I want to talk about uh, why, does, why does this matter? What can you do with these things? So um, I'm going to suggest that there are three primary ways that uh, everyone in this room can use these archives, right? So it's not, archives are not just for historians. They're for everyone that is part of this community. Uh, and so I'm going to do some very ahistorical uh, talking where I'm going to cherry pick really fun examples from across uh, some of these archival sources to, to try to show you some of the things that we might do with this uh, in our classrooms, uh, as we talk to alumni, as we th have these conversations with one another about our identity. Um, there's a lot of different ways that these sources can really help us. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to talk a little bit towards the end about some of the challenges our archives uh, face. So I really want to focus on what we can do with these sources. But of course, as many of you, have, if any of you have talked to me about archives, you know that there are some real uh, challenges. And following the talk, if anybody's interested, the library staff uh, has agreed to take people that, that want to on a tour of the archives. So you can feel free to just, just downstairs, take a few minutes, see what I'm talking about. You'll see many of the same things I'm going to show you pictures of here. Uh, and, and familiarize yourself with it. So my hope is that following this talk, all of you are better equipped to use this resource, which really is the heritage that, that we've inherited after 135 years of history. Uh, so that's the plan. Um, and let's go ahead and start with what are in our archives. So uh, these are a couple of images of archives rooms A and C. Uh, it's where most of our stuff is. And as you can see, they're very cramped. They've got lots and lots of stuff in there. To be honest, I've been looking around uh, for about three years and I don't know everything that's there. There's a lot of stuff, especially in uh, archive room C. Uh, there's a lot of stuff here. I just don't know what's there and I'm pretty sure nobody else does either. So there's a lot left to explore, a lot left to find out, a lot of our own history that we can still uncover, which I think is actually quite exciting, also daunting. Um, uh, and so we'll, we'll sort of talk about that. The different rooms, uh, archive room A is the main one that many of you are probably most familiar with. That's where most of our documents are. So if you were looking for board minutes or faculty minutes or something like that, that's where you'd have gone. Uh, archive C is kind of fun. This is the artifact room. Uh, and like I said, there's all sorts of stuff here. Uh, we've got a whole case full of trophies. Uh, we've got uh, architectural drawings from all the various iterations of planning for our buildings. Uh, we have all sorts of stuff, some of which I'll talk about uh, in today's talk. You'll notice I did not uh, show you a picture of archive room B because that's the room that gets flooded all the time. 
Uh, and we've taken as many of our archival sources out of Archive Room B uh, as we can, because it is uh, a real challenge, and it just flooded a couple weeks ago, too. So luckily, we did not have any of our documents. Nothing was ruined uh, in the massive storms that we just had. Um, so what are the, some of the things that you're going to find here? Uh, I think the most important resource, this is probably the most high value thing that we have, is the stylus. This is uh, the student newspaper, the voice of the student body for, uh, a, for many, many decades. You can see the, the dates here. Um, and it, actually, we, we know that it happens even before that. It's, it started to be in print in the 1890s. Uh, our run starts right now, at least in 1909. Uh, it's possible we do have some microfilm uh, that we're going to try to evaluate whether we have earlier runs or some of the later stuff. But it's really interesting. In fact, um, this is a very prominent newspaper in South Dakota for much of the 20th century. Uh, students were regularly winning awards for journalism. Many of our journalism students went on to be in local papers uh, in the region. Uh, so it actually is really quality reporting. It's one of the only places where students have a pretty authentic voice, right? This is not a marketing tool. Um, you know, many people have access to this, but this is students talking about their everyday experiences. Uh, so it's really interesting. And this is the, uh, 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 where I found that cartoon that it went out in the email. And I'll just show you a, a longer, larger version of this. This is from 1916. We had a president at the time, Rolvix Harlan, which is a great name for a president. Uh, Rolvix, we, we need to bring that first name back. So. Um, but uh, he came to be president, and his major uh, sort of push uh, was to, to acquire an endowment. So we'd gone for more than 25 years. We didn't have an endowment. So you can imagine how one bad year would have been, you know, I mean, one bad year now is bad with an endowment. One bad year without an endowment is catastrophic. Uh, so that was this whole thing. For uh, 1915, 1916, they engaged in this massive campaign. Uh, and this is them declaring victory by comparing it to uh, uh, battling in the trenches. Literally, Sioux Falls College had gone over the top uh, and had defeated uh, the hated enemies of pessimism, doubt, and lack of funds, uh, which I, I just think the imagery here is phenomenal. Uh, and our newspaper is just littered with examples of, of things like this. Um, You'll find yearbooks. Uh, this is the first yearbook, I think, after our name change for many, many years. The yearbook was called the Sioux Brave. Uh, I think there's one example on one of the tables uh, somewhere there. Uh, we have, uh, these are great. You get lots of uh, really uh, exciting pictures, but they stop in the 1990s. They'll be replaced by uh, buzz books for a while, and now we kind of don't have anything equivalent to that for our contemporary students. But it's okay, because they've got Facebook, so they've got as many pictures as they can possibly handle. I still think we should have something like this, but, you know, that's what they would probably say. Um, uh, very important sources in Archive A are board minutes and our faculty minutes. Uh, these take some going through. You get, you know, 90% of it is about how much money we're raising and stuff that most of us will just go right over our heads. Administrators accept it, I'm sure. Um, but every now and again, you run across something really interesting. So if you were to look at one of the first uh, boxes full of board minutes, you would find our original Articles of Incorporation from 1885, the foundational document of this institution, uh, which I think is is well worth a read um, to talk about what are, what were they trying, what were they setting out to do uh, when they first really organized uh, this place. Um, you'll also in the faculty minutes you'll see things like this. This is the document that that created interim. So whether you love it or you hate it, you can go and blame these guys uh, for, uh, for putting it in there. And they, they have, we have some of the documents about why they decided to do that, what uh, went into that discussion. I've seen some of it from the board minutes. I want to go deeper into these minutes uh, to talk about what were, what were the different sides of this. But they, for them, it was this very exciting moment where they could get more uh, focused experimental classes that took, took them out of the sort of norm uh, and got them into really exciting uh, new types of classes. Um, we get a lot of stuff uh, like press clippings. I already mentioned the, uh, the buzz books. Uh, press clippings are great because we get both our own sort of advertising, right? So when we release uh, press releases, that sort of thing. Uh, but we also have lots and lots and lots of news clippings. So uh, when the Argus Leader ha prints a story about uh, the college, that, that stuff, we've got that collected. And believe me, that saves a lot of time so you don't have to search through years and years and years of the Argus Leader because there's a lot of it. Uh, and you can just access a lot of that uh, right there. Uh, other sources, uh, we have a complete run of the college catalogs. Uh, you can also ask the registrars. They have a complete run as well. Uh, but every catalog uh, in the history of this place uh, is right there. It's really fascinating uh, to, to look at the curriculum, how it's changed. I think it's equally as fascinating to think how it stayed the same. Many of the fundamental features of a liberal arts education are not that different. Uh, than what they've been for the 135 years of this place and really for the, I don't know, 800 years since we've, you know, really had the modern university system. 
uh, and a lot of promotional files. So we have a lot of stuff from, uh, from marketing, a lot of speeches that people would give when they would go and travel to local uh, churches. They would go out and try to drum up support uh, in the community with the, with the Baptist Convention, all these other places. So a wide variety of, of types of sources. And this is not an exhaustive list. This is um, a, a, a partial list of some of the things I think might be most interesting for people. Um, oh, another one here, the Alumni Bulletin. Uh, this is the Alumni Bulletin where they officially announce that we've transitioned from being the Braves uh, to the Cougars. And what I love about this is that you can get a little bit of alt history here. So it lists the five uh, alternate names that we could have been, what might have been. We could have been the Bears, the Spartans, the Colts, uh, the Cougars, or the Comets. Personally, I really think we missed something. We could have been the Fighting Comets. I think that would have been amazing. Uh, what, a, what, a, what, what could have been? Um, but it also gives you the history of why we made that change. Um, for about two years before this, you'll see different reports uh, in both the student newspaper and the bulletin uh, about how the entire campus community was engaged in this. Uh, students, faculty, administration, uh, the wider community, everyone had a say, had a vote uh, in this process. And that's, I think, really instructive as we think about making big decisions. How do we incorporate all the various people that we serve, people that are a part of our community? Uh, really fascinating example there. Um, we also have these uh, these boxes that they vary by president to president. Some presidents have about a folder worth of stuff in there. Some presidents, Ruben Jeske, man, he's got like four and a half, five boxes. Because like I said, he's, he's prolific, that guy, if nothing else. Uh, making him, again, very quotable. Um, here is one of the more interesting things. We have uh, a, a letter to E.F. Jordan, uh, president of Sioux Falls College, the eponymous you know, name for Jordan Hall. Uh, from the famous American politician William Jennings Bryan. And I told that story to my wife, and she said, William Jennings who? And I thought, oh no, oh, oh no, I don't know what to do. So please ask somebody else, look it up on Wikipedia, don't ask me, it's gonna make me sad. Uh, but really important American politician in the, in the early 20th century, late 19th century. Uh, so stuff like that will, will pop up, and you never know what you're gonna find in these archives. And again, that, that is uh, very exciting, uh, and I think really uh, useful for us. Um, we also have a treasure trove of photographs, and these, I think, more than anything else, might help us engage our community, because I don't know that anybody's looked at the vast majority of, in fact, I, I'm quite confident nobody's looked at the vast majority of these photographs since they were created. Uh, and if we think of ways to decorate our campus, I think incorporating our history through image uh, would be a really powerful way to do so. So this is a picture of uh, Meredith Hall, the original building that uh, stood where uh, Jeske Auditorium and Chapel stands uh, right now. Uh, we have lots and lots and lots of athletics uh, pictures. Um, and to be honest, we don't even know the extent of, of what we have here. Here's uh, images from our centennial celebration in uh, 1983, uh, including, and this is in the uh, artifact room, this is our official centennial plate. I don't know if it's used for ceremonial functions anymore, but I don't see why it hasn't been if it's not. This is amazing that we have something like this. Um, but major pivotal events from the university's history, uh, we have them documented. We can show you what students look like, what did faculty, administrators, what did this, uh, this place look like? It's, you might not be surprised to know that the, the, the structure of campus looks very different today than it did 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, and so we can see that through images. Uh, and we don't know, like I said, what's there. These are just, if you go to the artifact room, you will find boxes and boxes and boxes of nothing but negatives. We have this whole treasure trove of images. Like I said, we don't even know what's there. Um, hopefully one day we'll get around to digitizing these because I think it would be just a remarkable testament uh, to this place, to what we've been uh, in the past. Um, so that's a little bit about what we've got. Um, now let's move to sort of why are they useful? And I'm gonna make a few arguments. Uh, the first being that archives should and can serve as a source of connection. Uh, to connect the current occupants of this place, of this institution, with the past occupants of this place and institution. Uh, so I want to give you some examples of, of what that might look like. And one just uh, struck me last week. I was going through, again, the alumni bulletin, uh, and I ran across these two images. How many people here know Al Johnson? So Al was one of the very first people that I, I met when I got to campus. Uh, in fact, I interviewed, and he gave me a tour of Sioux Falls the day after. And, and that day, it was about, uh, we had gotten, I think, like eight to 10 inches of snow the day before. And Al was not afraid 
and on my day of interview, uh, coming from a Florida background, he, we went off-roading uh, so that I could get a really good look of the whole town, and boy, was I worried. Uh, I came away with two thoughts, you know, one, I really hope we don't get in an accident, and two, this guy really loves this place. Um, and so I find files like this. This is Al Johnson back in the 70s leading alumni events already. He's been involved with this place for decades uh, by this point. I sent these images to Al as soon as I found them. Um, and he responded back. He's like, I don't even remember this. This is amazing that you found that. Um, and he and I are going to get together and talk about his experiences here and uh, hopefully uh, sometime within the next week or two. People that have been here love seeing stuff like this. This is a really great way to connect ourselves. We just had a whole conversation, strategic conversation about how do we collect, connect with alumni? Well, exhibit A, right? This is a really good way uh, to reach out to, to find people. Um, we can connect to our past accomplishments. As I said, we've got all these trophies and I literally have no idea what they're for. I really need to talk to somebody, maybe Dan uh, with Athletics, talk about what all these are for, where, what we might do with them. We have literally just tons and tons of these trophies uh, representing our past accomplishments. Uh, a lot of these sources talk about our Christian identity. So we have a whole run of uh, what they call pastor's handbooks, that they'd have these events every year where pastors from the region, many of whom were alumni, uh, would come and they'd receive some training. And this is, the, this, this is the information they were given about how do you go out and pastor a church. We have lots and lots of documents uh, like that. And some of those that are scattered around your tables too, these newspaper uh, articles talk about how they were worshiping, how, uh, what it meant to be a Christian here at Sioux Falls College or University of Sioux Falls has changed uh, over many, many decades. So I think those are things well worth thinking about and considering uh, as we find ways to connect uh, with our past. Um, we can also connect to Sioux Falls. Uh, I was sort of shocked to learn that it was uh, about 25 years, actually almost 30 years uh, before we raised, we, we did our first fundraiser in the city of Sioux Falls. 1916, the image I, I showed you earlier of Rolvix Harlan's uh, fundraising campaign, it's the first time we ever tried to raise money in Sioux Falls before that. It was all Baptists all the time. Uh, but since then, since 1916, uh, Sioux Falls has been one of the primary places of support. And of course, so many of our students come from Sioux Falls. We've got such an impact on this community uh, right now. You see lots and lots of documents from it. This is one, again, from uh, the 60s that talks about 75 years of service uh, in the Sioux Falls community. It just lists all these different ways that people have served their community uh, right here. And I think uh, there's a real way for us to, to sort of further that connection uh, with the city by using these sources, talking about some of these things uh, that we've done and this relationship between college and city that is really critical. I, I don't think it's too much to say that we are alive, we are an institution today because of our location, because it's been vital to recruitment. When many other colleges closed, we didn't, and a lot of that has to do with our relationship to Sioux Falls. Um, I think we should also, as faculty, we should connect to the big conversations. Um, there's a lot of ways we can use these documents, and, and uh, I uh, will show you some, some ways that I, I'm thinking about it. I'm, uh, it, you know, in the social sciences and humanities, we have these kinds of conversations all the time, but we just had a national conversation about blackface, and if that's something that um, you're going to tackle in your classroom, uh, and I know, you know, sciences, maybe, maybe not so much, uh, but in, in a lot of these other areas, you, you might want to talk about this. What better way to bring those conversations home than to say, this isn't just happening out there. It's not just those people. It's here too. And what does that mean? Um, and how do we sort of reckon with some of these issues uh, that we find as we look at this? Um, there's other ways to think about this too. Um, you know, if we can think about conversations with gender, we got a lot of these really great cartoons uh, that if you're a faculty member worth your salt, you can probably get at least 30 minutes of conversation out of each of these. Uh, I just love these two. Uh, uh, this is an advertisement for Coke. It's uh, a woman and a man on a date saying, it's so pure and wholesome, naturally friendly to your figure. Let it do good things for you. Her body is literally in the shape of a Coke bottle. There's a lot to analyze there. Uh, and this one, of course, the, the famous MRS degree. This, uh, this one is a, a picture of a, a, a senior female uh, who is literally trying to ensnare a man on campus. Right? Louise is a graduating senior. It's her last chance to catch a man. Right? This stuff is, is part of our record. And again, I can see uh, really interesting, uh, important conversations being happening by using this. And this is a really sort of humorous entry point into some of those things. but. I mean, th this is there. If you look at any of those, uh, if you have the stylus in front of you, um, look at their advertisements. The advertisements are great. Uh, and you'll see all sorts of stuff like this. 
Uh, of course, if you're also having classroom conversations about things like cultural appropriation, yeah, we've got that covered. <laughs> For about 50 years out of our 135 years, we were the Braves. Uh, and every year we had TP days, every year we had uh, people almost entirely white dressing up as Native Americans. Uh, and to hear them talk about the reasons they did so I think would really inform a conversation about cultural appropriation. If you talk even to people um, today that, are, that went here in the, uh, in the 60s and 70s, uh, they, you know, this isn't a problem to them. They thought they were honoring these cultures and we might feel very differently about it. Um, and, I, and I will say, I don't know who approved this image. But, but like, that is just awkward to go in a publication for this university, right? But you'll find stuff like that uh, in a lot of different places. Um, so I think we can connect our students to our past uh, and to these conversations that we're having, right? There's a lot of ways we can integrate this material uh, into our conversations, into our classrooms. Uh, and I think some really powerful ways to really drive that home, uh, to, to connect it with the here and now as well. Um, so to finish up this sort of first reason about our connections uh, that we can forge through the archives, there's so many different areas that I think could use this material. Uh, it's not just marketing, although I think obviously there are marketing implications if we have a better handle on some of this stuff. I mean, every couple of years we come up on, a, on another milestone. We can celebrate those things the more we know about our history. Uh, but athletics, of course, I mean, that's one of the most profound ways we can uh, uh, communicate with our alumni. We've got a lot of people interested in the athletics programs here. We've got a lot of material related to athletics. Just mention some ways we might connect our classrooms, our current students in the classroom to some of this material. Um, development, uh, the library admissions, I already mentioned, I think displays across campus could really um, use some of this material, particularly our artifacts. We could prominent, more prominently display uh, our history. And if I could just say something about that, I think there's this, this sense that we have something to be ashamed of with our history, that our history is, is problematic. It, it, from my reading of it, and now I have not read everything there is to read about it, uh, nor will I probably ever, but from, from what I do know, and I've probably been down in these archives more than anyone else, the, the worst sin that we're guilty of is being poor. And if I'm reading my Bible correctly, that's not actually a sin. <laughs> right? Yes, we've struggled with finances, uh, but that's not something we need to be ashamed of. I think, in fact, our survival, despite struggling with financial reasons, is something to celebrate uh, in a really powerful way. We don't have something to be ashamed of with our history here. Um, so I would challenge all of you uh, to think about ways in your buildings, in your classrooms, uh, as you uh, outreach to the community, how can we use these kinds of things uh, to connect better uh, with our current uh, constituents, but also with uh, those people that came before us. The second reason I think we should really be uh, using these is that these archives contain an awful lot of wisdom. So many conversations we have right now, I feel like there's this sense that we have to figure out everything, that the weight of all of these big problems is 100% on us. And the thing is, there's 135 years worth of people that also felt that way. Um, I'm not saying their answers will work for us, but I do think their answers, their solutions, their ideas can inform many of the things uh, that, that we continue to struggle with today. So I'm going to read you a quote. Uh, with the increasingly severe competition for students, we are now working harder and more effectively in recruitment with no assurance of gain. We must constantly consider and develop new approaches to recruitment. This is just one, of the, uh, one more of the realities we must live in within these crucial years. University of Sioux Falls President Brett Bradfield, 2019. <laughs> oh wait, 1972. But I can't tell you how many times I've heard administrators say something very similar to that, and I've only been here six years. Our problems, many of them, are pretty much evergreen problems for a university, a small university on the Great Plains. Um, and we've been solving them for a long time. And I take great comfort um, that you know things might be bad, um, but they're not Great Depression bad, right? We got through that. We can get through what we're going through. Um, last week at a strategic conversation meeting where we were talking about the liberal arts, uh, I brought up, well, we've had these statements of aim, statements of what our liberal arts should do many times. Um, and uh, we've come up with a lot of these different things. Again, we don't have to reinvent the liberal arts. Uh, I'm not saying we should 100% just copy what previous generations have done, but they've done a, they, they're powerful thinkers in their own right, and I think they can help inspire, inform us, uh, and we can use them as a source of wisdom as we deliberate the issues that we're facing, um, to use the wisdom of the past. Um, other ways that we can do this, um, we can find the roots of a lot of our current policies. So I told you I was doing research in the 1960s and 70s. I came across the first ever official statement on tenure at this institution. 
Uh, and it talks about, it gives a really important justification why. It says, without academic or intellectual freedom, both teaching and research are sterile, and the teacher is little more than a propagandist for prevailing pressure groups. Right? That's what this thing called tenure is all about. Right? It's really powerful. Now, uh, I should probably mention, this policy was not very well thought out, and they had to put a moratorium on it for five years, because before they figured out all the details of how we actually institute a tenure policy, but at least in terms of a statement of why we should do this thing, I think that's a really powerful, uh, important way to do this. And there's a lot of other examples. We can see the roots. I've already pointed out something like interim, uh, see the origin points of a lot of these things that uh, we've inherited, right? Um, and that, that sort of historical inertia continues to affect us, to shape um, the decisions that we're making today. And there's a lot of that that we can gain uh, a lot of wisdom from with these sources. So this is a very incomplete list, but just in my reading of this, these are some issues that the archives really speak to. First and foremost, from the very beginning, from sources I've seen from the 1880s, our Christian mission and identity was always on the minds of literally everybody that's ever worked here, from my reading. Right? Um, and that's as true in 1885 as it is in 2019. What, what that means might have changed over time, but I think there's a lot we can glean from the answers of people that came before us. Uh, the relationship between athletics and academics, that's been a concern for many, many years. We're not, it's not new to what we're experiencing right now. Uh, retention, accreditation, admissions, enrollment, oh my, right? All of these issues are issues people uh, have been grappling with, right? We are a small institution uh, that is, is now and has always been uh, enrollment driven, right? Um, so they've been trying to figure out how do we uh, accommodate new generations of students and tailor our experiences to them. Um, how can we articulate the liberal arts? What does it mean to be a liberal art uh, institution in the 20th century and now the 21st century? Um, these are debates that have, have been around for a long time. How do we communicate that the liberal arts are valuable to a changing society? That's also a, a constant concern in a lot of these sources. Concerns over finances, uh, I could have listed that as uh, number one through five here. There's a lot of concern over finances from top to bottom, right? Right through the whole history of the institution, that's been a, a primary concern, um, which is both troublesome and kind of sad, uh, and also inspirational that there's so many people that have been committed to this place despite all those financial challenges that we've experienced. Uh, changing student needs, uh, and then the relationship between faculty and administration, right? These are all really important issues that we're talking about all the time now. They've, there's lots there that we could explore uh, for how previous generations here have, uh, have experienced this. Um, and our third reason, I think that these archives uh, can and should be used uh, inspirationally uh, as we connect with all these different groups. I mean, this should inspire us. And I'll just give you some, this is the fun part where I get to really cherry pick examples that are just really cool stuff that I've noticed over the last few weeks. Uh, here's Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, visiting Sioux Falls and a bunch of our students went out to, to see her and then the students came back really excited writing all about um, Eleanor Roosevelt and, and what her impact has been on their lives. Um, really interesting stuff like, uh, like that. Here's a Sioux Falls College alum who traveled to the Paris Peace Conference of 1919 with, as part of Woodrow Wilson's retinue. Right? Fascinating. Right? Um, uh, uh, presidential candidate, actually I think Vice President Nixon uh, visited Sioux Falls. Um, and uh, was greeted by the Sioux Falls College Young Republicans. A whole gaggle of them went out there. Far fewer apparently went out to see candidate John F. Kennedy uh, at the time, which I think tells you a lot about how, what our students were thinking. Uh, but we have all these, these things that we're reacting to our region, but also to these national events. And, and when you go through these sources, um, you really get a sense for that. Um, I thought you might be interested to meet Brighton. Brighton is, to my knowledge, our only Rhodes Scholar. Um, the year 1919, he's the class of uh, 1922, uh, and he spent three years in London, but arranged it so that he could graduate um, with his class of 22 and then married his college sweetheart, Ella Lillibridge. Yes, from that Lillibridge family, right? Uh, these roots are deep for a lot of these families that continue to support our institution. He also had a really interesting story. So after his Rhodes Scholarship, he goes uh, and joins the State Department where he has a 30-year career, um, ends up uh, having some really important uh, uh, parts to play in sort of the early onset of the Cold War. Um, and also his family got really into model planes and won a lot of awards. So really interesting, well-rounded person, right? We're always talking about that here. Uh, I think he's a good example of that. Um, this is the groundbreaking ceremony for 
Mirrors Library. And what I love about sources like this is that it, it tells us a lot about how people were uh, experiencing this. So my favorite part of this document was the prayer. This is the prayer that they prayed for the library, what they hoped that this library could accomplish for them. We bless thee for the arts of human ingenuity which enable us to preserve what mankind has learned. And we humbly thank thee that we ourselves are the beneficiaries of these priceless gifts. I think what a wonderful way of sort of thinking about starting up an institution uh, of, of knowledge uh, like this library that now has 50 years or so of history. Um, really fascinating things, things that I think can and should uh, inspire us in many ways. Um, with the archives, and to sort of uh, finish up here to talk about the needs of the archives, the archives um, are not doing great. Um, in a lot of ways. And, uh, as I was thinking about this, I thought about Carol Mashik, um, who was asked to write the centennial history of the college, never actually finished it. We have part of her draft, a couple chapters got through. But one of the reasons she didn't finish it, I mean, one reason was that she was asked to write like 30,000 words and she was at like 50,000, right? And could, wasn't great at editing, editing her own stuff. Uh, but another reason was, as she was working on this, she would spend all this time down in the archives, uh, and people constantly asked her questions about our history. And so she writes this letter to the administration where she's talking about how so much of her time that was supposed to go towards researching and writing, that's what she was actually getting paid for, went to actually talking to people, helping students, uh, and, and helping them to understand the history of this place, answering their questions, finding them files, doing these kinds of things. Um, and she writes this letter, I think the most haunting part of it is that she's talking about all these things that she, that she was doing, and she says, who did them before I was here, and who will do them when the book is done? And the answer is no one and no one, right? Or rather, no one and hopefully us, right? Um, this is important work, connecting our students now with, with their past, um, but it is often uh, time intensive and it's often uh, problematic. One of the biggest problems, of course, is our physical space for the archives. Um, and I know this text is really small, particularly for you at the back, so I'll just go through this uh, fairly quickly. But um, beginning in the mid to late 80s, uh, so after the, the centennial, uh, we had a grant, a historic preservation grant that helped us get our archives in order in the 1980s. But following that, more or less collections became scattershot at best. We have policies in place. Um, we still get a lot of these materials, but it didn't happen as regularly as you uh, might imagine. And publications that are really important, like the stylus, like the yearbooks, they began to go uh, out of print, most likely because they, um, they were thought to cost too much, right? They're not cost effective enough, right? Um, even worse, though, is the problem of the digital dark age, which is that the university in the early 2000s, uh, we went all digital, um, and we stopped sending any of that digital stuff to the archives, right? So today, right now, 2019, we are producing more documents every day than ever before and keeping basically none of it. Uh, and the library staff um, are really working hard to develop policies that we can all contribute to this, but it's something that as a campus we really need to think about uh, preserving some of these uh, documents, making them accessible, uh, and hoping that the gaps that we've already had are not too severe. Uh, as I mentioned, the archives have experienced flooding multiple times in the last three decades, and I had to write as I revised this uh, in the last three weeks, <laughs> right? Um, so the physical space has, has been problematic. Uh, the rooms, as you notice from the pictures, and those of you that go on the tour will, will see, the rooms are pretty cramped. It's, it's sort of uh, one person can kind of get around uh, comfortably. More than that, you're going to have to you know, get in each other's personal space a little bit. Right? Um, so the physical space is a, is a problem. Um, and documents from the 1990s and 2000s, those that did make their way to the archive, they weren't really cataloged properly. So we have all these boxes of stuff, and we don't really know what's in them. Um, and it didn't go, because we didn't have anybody that was, that was doing the job, the hard work it, it takes to a organize, catalog some of these materials. So uh, thankfully right now, Laura Croker in particular has been going through what we have, uh, cataloging it. She's making entries uh, in the library website. So this is going to be searchable hopefully soon. I don't know, we'll, we'll probably announce when that happens. We're making some strides there, but there's some real uh, problems with this space, right? So uh, preserving our history, I think, is a collective task um, and it's going to start with, you know, making some uh, difficult uh, and possibly labor-intensive decisions about preserving these documents and then preserving the documents that we're still creating in the digital space today. Um, but I don't want to leave on a downer note. Uh, so I thought I'd end with the story of this, uh, this newspaper uh, article, or sorry, magazine entry. And I don't know if people are familiar with this. This is listed on our website when you read about the history. Ruben Jeske and his history of the college written in the late uh, 60s. Uh, he talked about this, but this is a... Uh, uh, an ad that went out in Time Magazine 
uh, time was uh, they cast a call. They wanted to promote institutions of higher education. So Ruben Jeske and the college put together or something and they sent it out uh, to, to time. Uh, interestingly, I learned later the, the story of it. So, the, so the, the, what came out is this idea of seven buildings in seven years. Uh, but famously, the tagline here is, but our stature comes from people. Yeah, we built a lot of stuff in the 1960s, the most explosive period of building in the university's history by a long shot. Um, but he, but he's, even at, at that point, the advertisement is, but people are what's really important here. Um, uh, interestingly, the original title, and I'm not making this up, was, what? You've never heard of Sioux Falls College? <laughs> Thankfully, Time didn't like that title, uh, and they rewrote it for us. Uh, I think we upgraded, personally. Uh, but later, when he was writing about it, Jeske had this to say. He said, our stature does indeed come from people, our very existence as a matter of fact. They're the people who've been here and either have completed their life's testimony or are serving somewhere now. Some of them are the people who are here at present, identified in our reference to faculty, students, and administration. Others are the people who stand in the wings to play their various important roles. Trustees, friends, members of churches, future students. These are the people, many, many thousands, who make Sioux Falls College. And I love, just love this last line again, very quotable, President. Aren't you deeply glad to be a vital part of so impressive a company and so great a task? I know I am. Uh, and I hope in this talk, uh, many of you have, have come to think of that, that impre the impressiveness of this task, that it's not just here and now, it's 135 years. There's this weight of history uh, hopefully pushing us onward, and I, I think that's uh, pretty inspirational. So I'm happy to take some questions. That's all I have for you today, but I'm happy to take questions. And those of you that are interested, if you want to go tour the archive rooms, you're welcome to do that as well. Thank you. Yeah, I probably shouldn't say this with joy here, but when they gave me a key to the archives, like I, my feeling was like, this is like letting the fox into the hen house a little bit, right? <laughs> the historian with a key to the archives, right? There are gatekeepers on this stuff for a reason. <laughs> um, so it has been interesting. But the, the, the dauntingness of it is, is just, there's so much work to be done cataloging and trying to think through what, what do we actually have and how can we make this usable uh, for others. Luckily, I'm not the only one that has to do it. I've been kind of aware of and concerned about this digital dark age for a while now. I know that you know, we haven't been systematic as we transitioned over to mostly electronic documentation. Are there strategies for trying to recover what we lost? Are there ways of dealing with this? Or is it kind of impossible to make up for lost time? I think there's going to be some loss no matter what we do. Um, our goal at this point is to put policies in place so that the loss stops now and doesn't continue. Sure, yeah. That's that's where we want to start, and then we're going to try to go back and see if we can if there are things. Because I think what has happened is that this information is just siloed. It's 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 out there. Yeah, I think it's a just, lot of it's still out in various offices. And yes, like exactly. That. So a lot of people have files that go back. But a lot of times when you see people, um, so I was looking at the media studies uh, uh, website, and their archive goes back five years. Right? And a lot of times, th these things are just automatically deleted after five years, ten years, right? And when we think about long-term preservation, what most people think of as, as archiving, right? We're like, no, 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 you need to be thinking longer than that, uh, have that long-term perspective. So that's some of the problems. So my hope is that when we, when we get these policies in place, we can start trying to collect a picture of what we've lost. But um, I think there's going to be some things that we just, we just don't have. Other questions? Just the year that we became Cougars? Uh, I, I want to say 77, it's voted on. 78 is the first year we're officially the Cougars. And when you think about conversations still going on about the appropriation of Native American names, I mean, that's kind of incredible that small conservative Christian college makes that change 40 years ago. Can you give me the date on the blackface picture? Yeah. Uh, that's in one of these books. Uh, you found it there. Is that 58? And that's not the only example that you'll find when you go through these. Uh, I would say there's there's not that many, right? So I don't think, you know, it's part part of the culture, part of the times, and that's an unfortunate part of the history of this country. We don't, we're not like we're doing it more than others, but it's certainly part of our past too. Any other questions? Any evidence of clan activity or pressure? 
Uh, I haven't run into it yet, but I also haven't um, looked into, especially the 1920s when clan activity in this region and nationally really reached a, a height. I know that um, we, uh, the, actually in conversation with the registrar's office, they were, um, we had collected some documents from a local colleges that closed and gave us their, their materials and we have found evidence of clan activity in those, um, including some really disturbing images of students uh, embracing that kind of ideology. So I'm really hopeful that we won't find that here, but I, I haven't looked uh, deeply enough into it. Speaking of troubled times, uh, did you find much about that era in the 40s when we switched, what, what two years as a junior college? Is there a lot uh, in the archives about that? Uh, yes, there's plenty. In fact, I wrote a book chapter about it. You can you can check it out over there. <laughs> it's a really interesting story. It's a miracle we survived the 1940s and the Great Depression. All right, well, thank you to everyone. Uh, and if you want to go on the tour, uh, you can talk to Sandy in the back.